So Revelation is this letter written to a group of Christians in the first century about things that were happening in the first century to help them understand what was going on. And as we've seen, it's this letter that has taken things from all the way back, even from creation back in Genesis, through the Exodus, and much of the Exodus story has been alluded to and and recapitulated or retold um, as a, a theme for God's people throughout all of history, culminating in a future Exodus-like moment. Then we have the exile, that's alluded to as well. In fact, we'll see, we'll see both of these elements in today's um, chapters as well in Revelation. Uh, and the exile and the coming back into the land also as a type uh, or theme for God's people throughout history, even for us today, and then culminating in the, the final return out of exile. And we've seen Jesus' words recapitulated again and different elements of the New Testament recapitulated or retold. And what we've seen is Revelation is not just a a picture of just what's going to happen at the very end. So all future events, for even for us today, these are all future events. That's not what Revelation is. Revelation is a revealing or an unveiling of the truth of the world as it is Today, as it was nearly 2,000 years ago when it was written, and as it will be at some stage in the future, whenever that is. Tomorrow, 100 years from now, 5,000 years from now. We don't know. But what we've seen over and over and over again in the letter of revealing Jesus in the book of Revelation is our call from Jesus, from our King, is not to watch the news and try to discern, is this going to be the very end of the end, but that we are clothed with his righteousness when he comes. He told us again, just last week, he's going to come like a thief, and we don't expect it. He says, so stop worrying about when Armageddon is coming, and start worrying about, are you clothed in righteousness? Today, uh, we're going to be in chapter 19, end of 19 and and, uh, all of chapter 20, some of the most, not necessarily controversial parts of the letter of Revealing Jesus, but certainly some of the most uh, focused on or accentuated, maybe in all of the Bible, actually, uh, for some parts of Christianity. I've preached on some of this before, so I'm not going to go into great detail where you might hope that I go into great detail, uh, talking about the different kinds of views of the millennium, for example. <clears throat> but what I am going to do is see what is Jesus trying to reveal in his letter in these chapters, rather than talking about the controversies around it. So with all that said, with, with that preface, uh, let me read for you Revelation 19, verse 11, and all the way through to the end of chapter 20. Then we'll pray and we'll see what God would have to reveal to us today. Then, so remember, he's had a series of different visions that are giving him different windows into the same reality. What's the world like right now? What are some of the things that are happening right now? And how do we have and maintain a heavenly perspective on what's going on and with a view to how it's going to finish? Then I saw heaven open and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True. And with justice, he judges and makes wars. war. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on a white horses, wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword came out of his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God the Almighty. So you may remember some of these themes are just recapitulation of things we've already seen in the letter of Revealing Jesus. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he called out in a loud voice, saying to all the birds flying overhead, Come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings the flesh of military commanders, 
the flesh of the mighty, the flesh of horses and of their riders, and the flesh of everyone, both free and slave, small and great. Then I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and against his army. But the beast was taken prisoner, and along with it the false prophet who had performed the signs in its presence. He deceived those who accepted the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image with these signs. Both of them were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword that came from the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds ate their fill of their flesh. Pretty grotesque, right? And now in chapter 20, we get another vision. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. That he drew him into the abyss, closed it and put a seal on it so that he would no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years were completed. After that, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones and people seated on them who were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, who had not accepted the mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them but they will be priests of God and of Christ and they will reign with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. They came up across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the encampment of the saints, the beloved city. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed them. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet are, and they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence, and no place was found for them. I also saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the books. Then the sea gave up their dead, that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. Each one was judged according to their works. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose names were not was not sorry, and anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. All right, we've got a lot to cover. We will try to do that in thirty minutes. Let's pray and ask, ask God for his help. Father, we do need your help. As always, when we open up your scriptures, uh, we don't want to just bring our own interpretations or worldly wisdom or things that seem best to us. Father, we want your truth. We want to know what you'd have us know, the things that are revealed in your scriptures, revealed to us today. Keep us close to your spirit, we ask, in Jesus' name, and so that we might bring him glory. Amen. So today, <clears throat> chapters 19, end of 19, and chapter 20, we have two more visions of the world as it is now and of how this age is going to be brought to completion. Not a chronological account just of future events, but, at, but windows into the world, revealing, of God is how, revealing how God is going to fulfill his promise. And if you are or have been students of the Old Testament, and we've alluded to these things or brought them up many times so far, you'll recognize these echoes of Isaiah chapter 66 in Revelation 19 and Ezekiel 38, 39 and towards the end in Revelation 20. In fact, very stark reminders or echoes of these things as Jesus and as John's writing them down, writing down these visions that Jesus is giving him uh, is is kind of bringing to mind these things from Isaiah and from Ezekiel. It's very, very important. These are, again, these are not just <clears throat> prophecies about how the very end is going to end. This is windows into the world showing us how God is fulfilling even things that he's promised and foreshadowed from centuries before this was written and millennia before today. So let me read just a little bit of Isaiah 66 so you get it. 
so you get a, a you know capture a bit of what is trying to happen here. This is Isaiah 66 uh, from verse 14. You will see, you will rejoice, and you will flourish like grass. Then Yahweh's power will be revealed to his servants. But he will show his wrath against his enemies. Look, Yahweh will come with fire. His chariots are like the whirlwind to execute his anger and fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For the Lord will execute judgment on all humanity with his fiery sword, and many will be slain by the Lord. For just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, will remain before me. We'll see this next week. This is the Lord's declaration. So your offspring and your name will remain. All humanity will come to worship me from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, says Yahweh. As they leave, they will see the dead bodies of those who have rebelled against me, for their worm will never die, their fire will never go out, and they will be a horror to all humanity. So again, these are not supposed to be pleasant, like lovey, nice kinds of images that God is giving both to Isaiah and then to John about his final, final judgment. They're supposed to elicit horror. It's actually supposed to be horror. God's enemies are destroyed. It is at the same time glorious to those who are being persecuted. Remember the readers of John's revelation, the revealing of of Jesus. The first readers were being brutalized and murdered by the Romans. So for them to hear, oh, God is coming again. And he is going to destroy his enemies and will be saved. For them, this is glorious. But for God's enemies, horrific, devastating. Why is this Revelation 19 picture of Jesus important? Uh, It's super important. We've seen these kinds of images of Jesus in Revelation before. The sharp sword coming from his mouth. Remember the Battle of Armageddon? This is the Battle of Armageddon again. Uh, Armageddon again, yeah. Um, How does a battle, is it a battle? It's not a battle. It's not a battle at all. In chapter 19, sword comes out, bam, done. Chapter 20, fire goes out, bam, done. Might might, um, remind you even of uh, Hezekiah. Remember Hezekiah? Uh, Back in his day, the city of Jerusalem totally surrounded. And what happens? Without one arrow being released, without one sword being unsheathed, the angel of the Lord goes out and kills them all, 160 thousand of them or whatever it was. It's the same thing we're seeing here. God's people just stand there in awe of their deliverer. White robe, sharp sword, iron rod, wine press, many crowns. We've seen all these uh, descriptions of Jesus before. The word of God, the logos of God. This is how John, the one who's writing this letter of revealing Jesus, this is how he begins his gospel account. The Logos of God, the Word of God became flesh. He was with God and he was God. He was in the beginning with God. Nothing was made without him. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is how John describes Jesus in his gospel. And this is how John describes Jesus in his vision. The same Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. This is the real God. We've seen the counterfeit God over the last couple of weeks, the counterfeit Trinity, counterfeit God, uh, the Father, the, the devil, the deceiver, the counterfeit Son, the first beast, the counterfeit Holy Spirit, the second beast, or the prophet. It's like the wish version. Looks great on the screen, but you order it and falls to pieces. Cannot deliver on any of its promises because it's a counterfeit. But this is the real God. This is the real Logos, the real Word, the real God. He's not covered in blasphemies like the dragon and the beast. He is covered in the truth. King of kings, Lord of lords. He is the conquering king. It's an important view of Jesus because The dominant view of Jesus in our culture, in Australia in 2022, is little baby Jesus in the manger. No crying he makes. So cute, so docile, so impotent. Or the like hippie, surfer, long-haired, blue-eyed Jesus with sandals and 
flowy robe and he always has a lamb for some reason that he's patting. Again, docile, chilled. You just do you, mate. We're cool. Look at me. How how could I ever judge you? You look great. You're doing awesome. You just just love one another. Whatever love means to you, just go and do that. That's awesome. No demands. He's just cool, man. He's chill. Chill, Jesus. This is why Revelation 19, picture of Jesus, is so important. It reminds us, man, Jesus' humanity is absolutely vital. We must not lose his humanity, right? He was a baby in a manger. He was a man who walked around, may have padded sheep. Was kind, was gentle, was lowly. His burden was light. He did deliver. He did love. But he also conquered sin and Satan and death. He's not a baby anymore. He is still human, still fully human. But he's also fully God. He never wasn't. Is why this picture of Jesus is so important. Jesus has wrath. He has majesty. He's not just a lovely guy like Bill and Ted. Be excellent to each other. That's not Jesus. He's the coming, conquering king. It said of him, he's the one. Remember last week we saw the wine press of God's wrath filled up to a horse's bridle for miles. It said of Jesus, he is the one who is crushing the grapes in God's wine press. His robe is dipped in blood. Some say that's his own blood. Remember, there's no battle. There's no battle. There's no, he doesn't go out and there's no fighting. Just total, overwhelming victory. So whose blood is this? Well, he's the one who is in the white press. How do, how do demons respond to Jesus when they meet him? Fear, always. Horror. Oh, I know who you are. Please don't send me to the abyss. Please let me stay. Surely it's not the time yet. But in our culture, oh, look at that little baby. How cute. Look at that cool surfer dude. He just wants us to be happy. We must not lose Jesus' humanity, uh, but we need to regain his divinity his holiness, his justice, and his wrath. The first view of this big battle, again, echoes Isaiah 66. And How do we see the end of God's enemies in Isaiah 66? Just dead bodies everywhere. Totally destroyed, totally done. Absolute victory. This is what is being revealed in Revelation. There are no enemies left when Jesus is done. And so for people who are first reading this, and there are people even in our world today who are being brutalized and pursued and imprisoned and beaten and murdered because of their faithfulness to Jesus, the faithful one, uh, this is really good news that every enemy will be overcome. Even the beasts will be thrown into the lake of fire. Even those human, governmental, and religious institutions set up to oppress the people of God and to rebel against God, they are going to be thrown into the lake of fire of all, utterly destroyed, no more enemies left. The second view in chapter 20 is here to echo and fulfill Ezekiel 38 and 39. We've seen this a few times actually already. Let me read from Ezekiel 38. Therefore prophesy, son of man, and say to Gog, remember we just saw Gog from Magog in Revelation, say to Gog, this is what Yahweh, God, says, on that day when my people Israel are dwelling securely, will you not know this and come from your place in the remotest parts of the north? You and many peoples with you who are all riding horses, a huge assembly, a powerful army, you will advance against my people Israel like a cloud covering the land. It will happen in the last days, Gog. I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me. When I demonstrate my holiness through you in their sight, 
I will execute judgment on him with plague and bloodshed. I will pour out torrential rain, hailstones, fire, and burning sulfur uh, on him, as well as his troops and the many peoples who are with him. I will display my greatness and holiness and will reveal myself in the sight of many nations. They will know that I am Yahweh. Now, again, this might echo the trumpets that we've seen or the seals that we've seen. These echoes of the Exodus even that are being echoed again in Ezekiel and foreshadowing and echoed again in Revelation at the very, very end. And he goes on in the next chapter. Son of man, this is what Yahweh, God says, tell every kind of bird and all the wild animals, assemble and come, gather from all around to my sacrificial feast that I'm slaughtering for you. A great feast on the mountains of Israel. You will eat flesh and drink blood. You eat the flesh of mighty men and drink the blood of the earth's princes, rams, lambs, male goats, and all the fattened bulls of Bashan. Revelation is the recapitulation, the, like the rounding off of all of the Old Testament prophecies. The summing up of everything that's come before. And again, what happens to God enemies, God's enemies? They're utterly destroyed. Dead bodies. The next chapter tells us it takes the people of Israel seven months to bury all the dead of the enemies. Number seven is not telling us a literal seven months. This is apocalyptic language to say that it will take the, the fullness. All of God's enemies are buried. Everything is done. There are no more enemies. Is that annoying to anybody else? The land, the land is cleansed, Ezekiel tells us. There's no more death. It's done. Thanks, Adrian. What about the thousand years then, the millennium? What about this thousand years? Uh, again, in our Doctrine That Divides series back in 2020, uh, preached for about an hour just on the main three and a half views on the millennium. So I'm not going to go into great detail into those views only to say that there are very godly men and women who hold to each of those views. And so uh, I'm not going to kind of stand here and say this view is terrible and this view is awesome, uh, any of those kinds of things. But what I do want to do is teach the scripture in front of us. And so to be consistent with the rest of Revelation, I, I want to tell you, uh, I read the thousand years as being figurative, thousand years. Not a future thousand years, it's another window into the reality of the world as it is today. Let me explain how. If the thousand years is a literal thousand years, this is the only number that's been taken as literal in an apocalyptic letter where all of the other numbers are symbolic. We've already had 1,000 being symbolic Back in the 12 times 12 times 1,000 for the, all of the people of God, it's symbolic of a vast number, it's symbolic of a, a lot. You need to do crazy things when you read Revelation if your starting point is a literal 1,000 years. Because then you go, okay, if that's 1,000, then in the next chapter when we're reading about the New Jerusalem and it's, uh, it's 12,000 stadia, length and width and height, then you have some sort of cube city, uh, which is silly. Twelve foundations. It's a sign pointing to significance. 144 cubits, again, 12 times 12. These are symbolic numbers we do is we set up in our minds the, the symbol, we piece the symbol together and we look at the symbol and go, that's the reality. Whereas the sign is pointing to the reality, the sign is not the reality. All, all of the way through, we've been trying to read Revelation consistently to see what is being revealed. If we just look at the blanket instead of what's being revealed, we actually miss what's being revealed. So I know there are some who say, well, if you deny a literal 1,000 years, you're not taking the Bible literally, therefore you're having a worse reading. I say it's the other way around. If you're reading poetry, if we're reading, we don't do this, again, with Song of Solomon. We don't think 
that Solomon is literally in love with a woman who has literal goats for hair or literal sheep for teeth or a literal clay tower for a neck. We know how to read it. If you're reading Song of Solomon literally, you know you're taking the worse reading, the bad reading of Song of Solomon. I want to put it to you, if you're reading Revelation literally, you're doing the same thing. You're falling for the same error. Something is being revealed. Something's being unveiled. A reality about the world as it is. Who are those reigning with Christ? Let's have a look. If we have a look at the elements of the thousand years, it helps us to explain why we should have a, we should view the thousand years as a very long time. We, we, we do this with our singing. Uh, we'll sing things like 10,000 reasons from a heart to find. We know, obviously, we don't stop at 10,000. We don't stop until we get to 10,000. It's just a really large number. Oh, we're going to sing in a minute uh, to a thousand generations. And doesn't literally mean when the thousandth generation is done, no more blessing. It's over, people, because it's only to the thousandth generation. No, again, it is an apocalyptic, a revealing. It's a massive number. A thousand generations, can you imagine it? That's what he's saying here. It's a, a thousand years. Who's reigning with Christ for the thousand years? It's those who have already died with, in Christ. Remember who the letter's being written to, people who are being brutalized and murdered. And they're wondering, just like Paul writes to the Thessalonians, and he says, uh, people are being brutalized and murdered, don't think that they're missing out. They're ruling and reigning with Jesus now. That's what Revelation is trying to recapitulate. Uh, we see this in um, verse 6 of chapter 20. Blessed, blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Again, this hyperbolic thousand years. They're going to reign for him, with him for a thousand years, for all of the time. What he's saying is, to his first readers, when you die, you may die. That's, that's death, but the second death has no power over you. So don't worry about dying. That's what's being revealed. Those who were being killed around these readers were reigning with Jesus now. Not a future thousand years. There's not going to be a first resurrection sometime in the future and then a second resurrection. I'm going to show you exhaustively from Scripture why that's not true in a minute. He's saying if you die now, you go reign with Jesus because you have already shared in the first resurrection. You, you're already... You are already a participant in the first resurrection. The second death already has no power over you. Let's look in uh, 2 Thessalonians. This is Paul writing to Thessalonica. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and of our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be easily upset or troubled, either by a prophecy or a message or by a letter supposedly from us, alleging, alleging that the day of the Lord has come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he sits in God's temple proclaiming that he himself is God. Again, remember we see the deceiver sets himself up as God until he comes again to deceive until a great apostasy happens, which is a future event. I'll show you this again from Scripture. Until that happens, don't be concerned about rumors of Jesus. And you know, I'm oh sorry, don't you remember that when I was still with you, I used to tell you about this. And you know what currently restrains him? Who is currently restraining the lawless one? You know what currently restrains him so that he will be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. But now the one restraining will do so until he's out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. The Lord Jesus will destroy him with the breath of his mouth and will bring him to nothing at, his, at the appearance of his coming. So when Jesus comes and the sword comes from his mouth, that is the end. That's not the beginning of a thousand year reign. That's the end when that happens. Not the beginning, the end. Jesus says as such, John 5. Same, same John writing in his gospel, recanting, recalling what Jesus said. And just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so the son also gives life, give, gives life to whom he wants. 
The Father, in fact, judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, so that all people may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Who is pressing the wines, the, the grapes in the wine press of God's wrath? It's Jesus. Anyone who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes in him who has sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. Not a future first resurrection and then a subsequent second resurrection. If you're in Christ, you have been raised with Christ. Truly I tell you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. It's like you were dead in your trespasses, Paul echoes. But now you've made alive in Christ. You have already been raised with him. This is what we're celebrating. We're symbolizing when we baptize people. Go under the water, symbolizing you have died with Christ. And coming out of the water, you have also, you have also been raised with Christ. You have been raised with Christ. And then we look forward to the second resurrection when we are reunited with our bodies in the new heaven and the new earth. For just as the Father has given has life in himself, so also has he granted to the Son to have life in himself. And he has granted him the right to pass judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this because the time's coming when all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good things to the resurrection of life for those who have done wicked things to the resurrection of the condemned. Paul echoes this again to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15. But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. All are already dead in Christ. Uh, all are already dead in Adam, I should say. But also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Afterwards, at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. So it doesn't say when Jesus comes back and then there's a millennium. He says, no, no, all who, all who are dead are looking forward to that second resurrection. We've already attained the first. Second resurrection coming when he comes, and that's the end. Not a, not a new thousand years. That's the end. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he abolishes all rule and all authority and all power, for he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be, abol to be abolished is death. How is death thrown into the lake of fire and then all of a sudden there's a thousand years? It's not what happens. There's a different windows into the same events. Jesus rose. When he comes, we will rise with him, united with our bodies. That's the end. It's actually the new beginning, really. Lastly, in case you're not convinced. 1 Thessalonians 4. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep. Again, why is he writing these things? He's writing these things because Christians have started dying. And they were worried, oh man, if they've died, are they going to miss out? Similarly to the ones who the letter of revealing Jesus is written, to whom the letter of revealing Jesus is written, and people are being brutalized and, and, and dying. Are they going to miss out? They're not going to miss out. Uh, so that you don't grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For we say this to you by our word from the Lord. We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together. So we're all together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So we're a turn of Christ at the end of the age, not a new millennium. We are in the millennium now. This is the thousand year rule, of right, rule and reign of Jesus. We're in it. It's not a literal thousand years. Again, remember it's a... It's a thousand, it's, hyper, it's hyperbole, it's a thousand years. He is, since his resurrection, already ruling and reigning, and the scriptures consistently tell us he will do so until 
Every enemy is put under his feet. And the last enemy is death. So it's all of his enemies have been dealt with. Then, even in the end, even death is dealt with. And so there is no more death. What about Satan, though? I thought he was bound for a thousand years. Satan is bound now. Satan is bound now. We're in the thousand years. Satan is presently bound. What does Jesus tell us about Satan's binding? In Mark 3, it's recorded, the scribes came down from Jerusalem and said about Jesus, he is possessed by Beelzebub. It's by the power of Satan that he's driving out Satan. That's how he's doing his miracles. And what does Jesus say? He summoned them and spoke to them in parables. How could Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is finished. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. This is all in the context of how is Jesus exercising authority over Satan? How is he doing his works? He's not doing them by Satan. How can, the strong, how can you plunder the strong man's house? And as he first tie up the strong man, unless that strong man is first bound. Jesus says, no, the kingdom of God has come among them and he has the power to bind Satan and to plunder his house. That's why Satan's given his power to the beasts to deceive the nations. He no longer has that power. He's been bound. He can... Still deceive the nations in certain respects, but not in respect to the kingdom of God and to the power of the gospel going out. Revelation tells us Satan will be unbound at some future stage, that there will be a great apostasy, the man of lawlessness lawlessness will come again, but he comes to be crushed. He comes to gather his people and to be defeated. Luke 11 tells us Satan is bound, but is still active. Jesus says, I am the stronger one who's taken away the armor and divides the spoils among my people. I think Satan is bound. John 12 says, Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Matthew 10 recounts the same thing. Revelation 12, again, Satan is still active but powerless against the gospel and against the people of God. Remember Jesus sends out the 22, uh, Luke 10 is what it says. They return with joy and say, Even the demons are subject to us in your name. Jesus says he has bound the strong man and he divides the plunder, the divides the spoils among his people. This is the first pictures we see of that. And Jesus says this, I watch Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. Not literal snakes and scorpions. It's the same snakes and scorpions that we see alluded to in Revelation. Again, it's in the context of driving out demons of the gospel being proclaimed. It's like I've given you authority over those evil things and over all the power of the enemy. What power does the enemy have over God's people now? None. Except what we volunteer. Jesus has given his people, us, all power over the enemy. Nothing at all will harm you, he says. It's not to say, let's get some scorpions and some snakes and try to you know, trample them and, and then they'll bite us or sting us and then we won't be harmed. That's not what he's saying. He's saying the enemy is bound. Now go plunder his house. He says, however, don't rejoice that the spirits that submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Again, the, uh, the context here is the authority given to God's people to proclaim the gospel, to plunder the house of the strong man. He is bound. He's in a corner. He's thrashing about. His agents are still at work in the world, but he's bound. He can no longer deceive the nations when it comes to the proclamation of the gospel. 
Mike McCrindle, local, well not local to Adelaide, but local to Australia, uh, released uh, a, some survey results recently and he said nearly two out of three Australians, way over half, almost two out of three Australians, responded positively, like yes. They answered yes to the question, if a good friend invited you to church, would you go? Over half. I mean, that's just a numbers game at that, at that point. The strong man is tied up. We've been given all authority. Why are there pockets of the world where the gospel lacks power? It's because we're not plundering the strong man's house. We're either distracted by the world. We like the house, comfortable house. Let's hang out in this house. Or we buy, we buy the lies, the wish version, the counterfeit God. Or we're afraid because we value our lives. Or we think, we, we see Jesus saying, you won't be harmed. And we think that that's a physical, material promise instead of a spiritual, eternal promise. And then when we get our feelings hurt, we recoil, or, or not in our context so much, but in the world today, certainly, with this physical pain, recoil, although the ones who are suffering the physical pain are the ones who are staying true to the word of God. And we who suffer little pricks of our ego uh, or little kind of annoyances, we're the ones that recoil unbelievably. But Jesus has bound the strong man. We're meant to be ruling and reigning with him now. We've already been raised with him. We are already a new creation in him. We already cannot be harmed. We are held in his righteous right hand. And even like the statisticians and the demographers tell us, still, over half of your neighbours or your friends would say, yeah, I will, I will come to church with you. I don't even think that's the best method of evangelism, is bringing people here. I think instead of the in-drag, I prefer the outreach, where Jesus said, I've tied up the, I've tied up the, the strong man's, uh, you know, in his house, go plunder the house. Don't try to bring him over to our house. Go plunder the house, his house. God is still saving people. This is our story over the last 10 years of Cedar Light's existence. We've seen dozens and dozens and into the hundreds of people who have been radically transformed by the gospel of Jesus, who have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, taken out of the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of the sun in glorious light because the strong man's bound. We're in the thousand years of binding now Revelation 19.20, it shows us again, Jesus rules and reigns now. Still redeeming those out of death to life. Still redeeming those out of darkness into light. Still redeeming those out of rebellion and bringing them into his family. Still bringing people out of shame and into joy. Still bringing people out of nakedness and clothing them in righteousness with fine, pure white linen out of counterfeit into the real thing, and just like Revelation 19, we are the ones lined up behind him. We're the ones sent out into the strong man's home to bring in the plunder, to share the spoils with him, not material spoils of war, not gold and land, but brothers and sisters, the men and women Jesus is drawing to himself. The gospel is still the power under salvation. Still today, God is still at work. This is why Jesus reveals to John and it is revealed to us that the strong man is bound so you can have boldness when you proclaim the gospel. Not, not to be a jerk, but boldness, knowing that some will respond because Satan is prevented from deceiving all of the nations. Some will respond. 
God is still in the business of saving people. Have confidence because the deceiver is bound. Have boldness because Jesus is still drawing people to himself. Have joy because the gospel is still saving people today. Today. That's why we need to have this big picture of Jesus who still rules and reigns. This picture of Satan, not that gives us fear, but to show us his, his boundness. And what is his future? He's going to be judged at the end. All of those who are enemies of Jesus, what is the future? It is death and destruction. No future hope for life. It's supposed to make us go, oh, that's, it is fair, but it's not good. And it doesn't have to be their end. But we have, we are the ones who've been invited to go and help plunder the strong man's house. What does it look like for us? It looks like faithfully living the life that Jesus has called us to. Being still with the Spirit. Faithfully professing and proclaiming the goodness of God and his, his coming wrath for sure. Uh, not shrinking back in fear, even to the point of death. Knowing that we won't taste second death. The power of the second death has no power over us because we're already raised in Christ and we look forward to the resurrection in the future. Man should give us great confidence. It also means we should encourage one another in the same kinds of ways. Example to one another what this looks like. Uh, call one another back when we're getting distracted or deceived uh, by the world or the evil one. Uh, and in every way we can have great confidence in Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for these words. Thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us in Jesus. Thank you that we know that Jesus is ruling and reigning even now. We don't have to wait for a future day for your reign. Know that you have defeated Satan and sin and death, so we're no longer subject to those things, but we are subject to Jesus. Father, we, we know the strong man's been bound, and so help us to not fear him or the beasts or anything in the world, but with confidence, with boldness, go and plunder that house, bringing sons and daughters into glory with the power of your spirit and the power of your gospel, we would see sons and daughters come to faith, brothers and sisters join the family. Uh, Father, help us to have joy as we go about uh, this the business of doing life, the mundane things of work and home and vocation and neighbouring and all those kinds of things. Uh, help us to do it with joy and confidence, boldness, in living and proclaiming uh, the gospel. And Father, would you save some through us so that we get to share in the joy of that plunder. We pray this in Jesus' holy name and for his sake. Amen.